did highlight also that usually when you have expectations of rising interest rates, particularly from the Fed, a lot of the emerging markets in Southeast Asia do see equity outflows. But a funny thing of the last two months, we did highlight that Malaysia, for instance, saw about two billion ringgit in inflows coming in. And it seems that there are more investors that are coming back to emerging markets, including that of the Philippines at varying uh, and uh, uh, perhaps albeit at a smaller quantum. Um, why do you think this time around investors are sticking with Southeast Asia? Is this the reopening play trumping um, perhaps rising interest rates from the U.S. this time around, and how long could this last, if ever? Yeah, I think the reopening play is, is a big part of this uh, return in foreign interest in, in ASEAN. And the other part of it is the fact that you know regional indices are very defensive in nature; uh, they're very old economy. So, in in a in an environment where you know rates are hitting higher very quickly, economic uncertainties and tech in particular being very vulnerable, we don't have the same sort of vulnerabilities uh, when you look at ASEAN uh, and the composition. Uh, of the indices here. I mean, you mentioned Malaysia as a big beneficiary of uh, net foreign inflows this year, but actually it's not the biggest. Uh, Thailand has been the biggest uh, beneficiary followed by Indonesia. So the whole region, uh, in a sense, is seeing a return of foreign interest. But I would say a lot of that is, is really driven by uh, safe haven uh, desires and the part of investors, rather than any you know major sort of uh, differentiation in terms of the pressures facing ASEAN. I mean, we will uh, like every other region in the world, face an economic slowdown going into the second half of this year. The question is, what is a quantum, and you know, and and what are the headwinds? Uh, in, inflation, interest rates, big issues uh, in developed markets, also issues in ASEAN, but to a much more diluted extent. And I think that's what's uh, drawing investors at this point in time. Um, sticking with Malaysia, actually, um, we look also at the rate differentials with the Federal Reserve, and I think Malaysia, after the Bank Negara hiked rates by 25 base points, is now equal to the upper end of the Fed Fund's target range. Is there ro more room for them to actually do more to raise rates and to normalize uh, the, the policy rates in Malaysia, given the fact that economic growth there is arguably the strongest when you base it on the second quarter figures? True. I mean, we are still looking at about a 6% GDP growth in Malaysia. That's ex extremely healthy compared to many other countries uh, this, year, this year. I think you know, our house view is that Bank Negara will raise again uh, in November by another 25 basis points. And we'll probably top out with another 25 basis points increase in the first quarter uh, in 2023 to take the OPR to 3%, which is what it was uh, pre-pandemic. So we will normalize. I think the, the issue is how quickly will we normalize? Uh, and that's been a question for most of ASEAN. You know, ASEAN has been raising rates belatedly and in a laggard manner compared to the Fed. Uh, and the currencies have taken a bit of a, a, a hit uh, on this. So I think it boils down to the, to the fundamental question, you know, how much currency pain uh, are the central banks here willing to take? And in the case of Bank Negara, they've made it very clear that they, you know, they are willing to take some because they don't look at it from a US dollar ringgit perspective. They look at it from a trade weighted basket versus ringgit perspective. And from that perspective, the weakness in the ringgit is nowhere near as dramatic as the US dollar ringgit exchange rate would indicate. So they're you know, fairly comfortable to maintain a moderate increase in interest rates going forward.